Hi everyone, fellow time travellers. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, it's always a pleasure to travel through space and time with you. In fact, I wouldn't do it on my own. Uh, Paul and I wouldn't do it without you. So uh, thanks every single one of you for being there. Um, we're in that territory now, uh, in, the, in the love letter to the British Isles, where we hit the war, the First World War to be specific, which as far as I'm concerned is the single most significant thing that's ever happened in, in the history of humankind. Uh, it's often described as being like a set of iron railings uh, that, that separates the past from the present. We can see the past, we can see what it was like, but we can never touch it again uh, because of what was done during the years from 1914 to 1918. And so much the story of history is about horror and, and tragedy and self-inflicted harm and so on and so on. Uh, but it's important to be reminded of pain. Uh, it's important to remember the suffering that, that we as a species have inflicted upon one another in the name of empire and in the name of war and so on and so on. It's a series about learning lessons from the past um, and as I say, World War One might be the, the starkest reminder of all and for all. To help support this podcast series, I uh, get extra exclusive content every week. You could sign up, you should sign up to my patreon.com site. It's easy, go to patreon.com, search for me by name, you'll find me. Uh, and you part with a bit of cash. And that bit of cash, monthly or annually, is what makes the podcast series possible in its entirety. Uh, so if you're already uh, a supporter, a thousand thanks. Uh, and if you would like to become a supporter, well, then I can't encourage you strongly enough. OK, that's the advert over. It's time now to strap into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. Objects contain absent people, and if ever there were absent people, it's the millions that were harvested by the First World War. In this episode, we follow the road leading to the remembrance of the Great War. Appalled by the number of casualties he was seeing on the front line, and troubled that those dead were not being recorded properly, one man began to keep note. The 11th of November 1919 was the first anniversary of the war's end. A temporary memorial of remembrance to mark the fallen was raised. An outpouring of grief and the public's actions ensured it was made permanent and a nation promised thereby never to forget. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last episode we travelled with you to meet five lost souls. Five brave brothers who set off to war and never returned. Where are we this week? Yes, Paul, uh, last week we got a snapshot of the tragic impact the war had on one solitary family, the Souls family from Gloucestershire. The grief that family went through happened to millions right across this archipelago. And when the war ended, people's heartache led to the largest public art project ever seen, as communities across the land took it upon themselves to build their own local memorials, so to remember their dead. In this episode, we're walking down White Hall to the memorial the public made permanent. It's the Cenotaph. Paul, we're continuing really for the third in a row with thoughts of the First World War, or the Great War, the war that took place between 1914 and 1918, and the specific location 
the ground zero for this one is the Cenotaph in Whitehall in London, which is Great Britain's national memorial to the dead of the First World War. Cenotaph means the empty tomb, which is perfectly appropriate because we've noted before that the British Army policy was and is that the bodies of the fallen of the First World War would remain where they lay. So they were buried in France and they stayed in France. And so uh, the memorial that was raised for them, and we'll get to the detail of it, was an empty tomb. Because there's no one there. It does, of course, if you've been past it, it does have the look of a gravestone. It's a fairly simple monolith of white Portland stone or very pale Portland stone. But it's a, there's nobody there. There's, it's just a memorial. Uh, and it's that continuation of, of the story that fascinates, moves and obsesses me, really. Every aspect of the, of the First World War. I, I, I try not to get too hung up about the numbers. And I don't, I'm not particularly attracted to understanding the tactics why, you know, individual generals took individual decisions, you know, you know why, they, why they went for set-piece battles like the Somme and, and, and the rest. I'm always just, I don't know, filled with empathy and sympathy for the men and boys that took part. That's really what I think about. It's just its impact. I feel its impact like a punch to the stomach somehow. So I mean, my way, my way into it, I've I've read all around the the idea of of how many people were killed, uh, and somebody else who was affected by it even as it was happening uh, was an Englishman called Fabian Ware. He tried at the outbreak of the war to join the army. But he was 45, which to you and me, Paul, sounds like just a lad. (laughs) Now that we're in our, now that we're into our 50s, uh, 45 doesn't sound uh, very old at all. But by the standards of the British Army in 1914 and and now, he was too old for active service, Uh, and he could have just bided his time. Really, he could just have uh, thanked his lucky stars. But like like so many others, he, he wanted to be there and to do his bit. So he kept on bothering the authorities, kept on writing letters and trying to persuade people that there must be something that he could do. And eventually his perseverance paid off and he was put in charge of an ambulance unit in France. So obviously the casualties, you know, it started slowly and then it became an avalanche of casualties. And so he he was part of, of an ambulance unit doing what it could to help the injured and to get people away from where they had been hurt and to get them to field hospitals and to and to administer what help they could. But really, from very early on, he was appalled by the number of casualties. He realised very early on that something epic was happening and that the death toll was extraordinary. And as well as being appalled by the numbers of people being hurt and killed, he, he, he was also offended really uh, and certainly upset by the fact that they weren't being recorded the numbers of dead that were happening all at once during heavy bombardments and battles there was no way for for burial parties to keep on top of it and he was appalled at the way in which people seemed to be being bundled into hastily cut graves or mass graves and, and no one seemed to be able to keep track of of who was going into the ground you know, we've talked about it before, it was the dog tags. To begin with, the soldiers only had one and the dog tags were taken from the dead to stop their pay because the British Army doesn't pay dead soldiers. But after massive disasters like the Somme, they were ending up with mountains of dead men, mountains of butchered meat. And because their dog tags had been taken away, by the time they got round to burying them, they knew who was dead, but they couldn't put names to bodies. And so all of it, all of it became this horrendous, I suppose, a collateral horror. Really, was the fact that that dead men were were being lost. And so he he began Fabian where he, he began keeping note by himself where he could. He tried to keep track of the deaths that he encountered personally. And to cut a long story short, on account of his efforts after the war an organisation was established that was initially called the Imperial War Graves Commission, the British Empire being, you know, imperial. 
Now it is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And for anyone who's visited any of the battlefields, anyone who's seen the cemeteries of the First World War and others, these are maintained. These beautifully manicured and carefully kept cemeteries are looked after by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. An organisation that prior to the First World War nobody imagined would ever be needed. But then in, in the aftermath of the war, there it was, and, and there it is to this day, and it's extraordinary. To this day, they look after well over 1.7 million graves in more than 150 countries. Sometimes it's a cemetery of hundreds or thousands of gravestones. Sometimes it's just one or two. They're always perfectly kept. They're always perfectly maintained. There'll be a, a gravestone where possible with the name cut into it. Where it's not known, it'll say a soldier known unto God. And they are not forgotten. They're looked after. And they're looked after in those places, those memorials to the dead are maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And that was, that was down to Fabian Weir. He was the man that drove that initiative to pay attention to the dead. It's great that he had the presence of mind at the time to, to know it needed remembering. Yes, I, I, I would have, you know, he won't have been alone. The same thought will have occurred to many, but Fabian Ware's name is right at the top of those that did their utmost to try and make sure that the dead would be remembered and that their graves would be properly looked after. I think I've quoted this before, it was Fabian Weir who calculated that if all the soldiers who died for Britain and the Empire were somehow to rise up from their graves and march four abreast past the cenotaph in Whitehall, the procession would last unbroken for three and a half days. And that line of men, four soldiers wide, would stretch from the cenotaph to Edinburgh. It's an unimaginable procession of the dead, and a brotherhood of death. The truth is, for all of the aforementioned reasons, no one is absolutely 100% sure how many men died. It's only estimates, best guesses. But those from the British Isles and from the British Empire, because soldiers were conscripted and volunteered from all of the, what are now the, you know, the Commonwealth countries and, and elsewhere, a million. Imagine that, there's 67 million people in Britain, they tell us at the moment. You know, so a million men died in the First World War at a time when the population of Britain was considerably less than it is now. And I think a lot about something else we've mentioned before, which is this policy of just leaving the men behind, or leaving their bodies behind. And it made sense, the logistical challenge of bringing hundreds of thousands and then a million dead bodies back to Britain to bury them. It's, it's you know, how, how could you go about organising that? And so they didn't. The policy was just to have these graves where the men fell. But it did mean that for the families, for each individual family who lost someone, it undoubtedly made matters even worse because there was nowhere to go. There was no grave to visit. Uh, you know, a lot of people get comfort from visiting graves or other memorials to their dead, and there was there was nothing. The war ended on the 11th of November 1918, and it was organised that exactly a year later, on the 11th of November 1919, that there would be a, a victory parade. There would be a a celebration was maybe the right word, I don't know, but the fact that victory had been achieved was going to be marked with a military procession, the first of the long line of ceremonies that we've all witnessed now taking place in Whitehall every Armistice Day. And what had reached the British government that the French were building a memorial that was the focal point of the procession. And, you know, Britain and France, <laughs> you know, relations are always a bit, you know, spicy. So someone decided that, well, if the French were going to have a memorial, we would have one as well. 
And so th- things had to be organised pretty quickly because it was quite late in the day. And an architect called Edwin Lutyens uh, was commissioned. He was given two weeks to come up with something suitable. And he it was that had come up with the idea for a cenotaph, an empty tomb. So he came forward after a fortnight with drawings and they were, he showed them to the Prime Minister, who was David Lloyd George. And probably because time was pressing, but maybe David Lloyd George and others looking at the drawings were suitably impressed. Anyway, they went ahead with it. And because time was so short, it was commissioned and made in wood and painted plaster. So they just erected a wooden structure and put plasterboard over it and painted it white. But keeping the same shape, the cenotaph that you see in Whitehall today, well, it, that was pretty much what was there, but rendered in timber and plaster. And the site was chosen at Whitehall, just round the corner from Downing Street. The plan was that it would just be there for a few, you know, for a few days. But as things turned out, in an unexpected sequence of events, it became apparent that they could never do away with it. The ceremony, the procession went ahead... All the veterans and whoever else, the dignitaries, they marched past this this plasterboard cenotaph. And once the procession had gone, spontaneously and in a completely unplanned way, many spectators began stepping forward and laying wreaths. Bouquets of flowers, single red roses, whatever. And I've imagined that it must have, from above, it must have looked like blood. It's all these red flowers going down. It must have looked like that the cenotaph was bleeding around its base. But in any event, a mountain of flowers began to build up and it became apparent that that what had been created in timber and plasterboard meant something to people. And the decision was quickly taken to transform that which had been ephemeral and temporary into something that would last forever. And so it was that by the time of the second anniversary on the 11th of November 1920, uh, that temporary structure had been replaced in pale Portland stone. During the course of the First World War, where a soldier fell, or many soldiers fell, where they were put in a grave, a wooden cross would be erected first with just the name, you know, maybe a card or the soldier's name and details written on the cross. And then later that was replaced with stone. When time allowed, it was replaced in stone. So there was, there was a process whereby temporary crosses were replaced with something of wood, petrified, if you like, made into stone. And a lot of those crosses came back. If you go to parish churches all up and down the country, you'll see some of those crosses were repatriated. So there was this process of transforming that which had been temporary into something that was permanent. And it was echoed in what happened at the Cenotaph. That transformation of the Cenotaph, what had been wood and plaster into stone, was completed then in time for the second anniversary, the Armistice Day of November the 11th, 1920. And that meant that its unveiling coincided with the arrival back in Britain, from France, of the unknown warrior. He was amongst several unidentifiable bodies that were lifted out of the ground from some of the the great charnel houses of the war, like Arras and the Somme and so on. And a blindfolded British officer selected one at random. It was deliberately done so that nobody could know who it was, whether it was a soldier or an airman or, or whatever. His anonymity was the whole point. And he was then brought back across France. His coffin was put aboard a battleship, a French battleship, which delivered him to England. And he was loaded aboard a train and brought with all honours. He was inside a coffin of oak, specially commissioned. Uh, Into the coffin went a crusader sword. Uh, So all possible honours had been bestowed upon the unknown warrior. And then a gun carriage bearing his coffin made its sad and slow procession towards Westminster Abbey, where he was interred and where he lies to this day beneath the slab identifying him as the unknown warrior. Mm -hmm. 
But on his way, the gun carriage passed down Whitehall. It came alongside the cenotaph, which at that time was still covered in Union flags. Hadn't yet been unveiled. But when it was alongside, when his gun carriage was alongside the, the cenotaph, King George V stepped out and laid a wreath of red roses and bay leaves so that there was a, a coming together, a communion, if you like, of the unknown warrior and the central point of all of Britain's grief for the fallen of the First World War. And then he proceeded from there to Westminster Abbey. That need of places in the landscape where people can set down their grief, if only for a little while. Grief's a burden that people carry for a lifetime. Uh, it can never really be set down, I suppose, but at a graveside, at a gravestone, or at a war memorial, there might be some brief respite in knowing that that's a place set aside in the landscape for the very business of remembrance. And it's worth saying again and again and again that that need for places to go at which to think about the dead was felt not just in Whitehall, but it was felt all over the country. And, and that's what inspired the creation of the war memorials of the First World War. There's between 36,000 and 40,000 war memorials in Britain. Every town, every village, everywhere that lost. And it's also very significant that the government didn't pay for those. Without exception, those memorials were paid for by the communities, by the people who had lost. And so they raised funds. They made contact with artists. They had artists come up with designs and then those artists were commissioned to make statues of soldiers or plaques or whatever the community each in its turn chose. There were also thankful villages. The thankful villages was the name given to those, uh, those little communities that had sent away men and boys to the war and got them all home. And so they were thankful, but even those villages raised memorials and put upon them the names of the men who had gone away and come home. But it's without a doubt the greatest public art project in British history, because every single community seemed to want to have a place near at hand where a service of remembrance could be held and where people throughout the year could go when the feeling moved them and lay a wreath or a poppy or a flower or a bouquet and think about whoever it was that they had lost. So that creation of these obelisks, of which the Cenotaph is perhaps ranked number one, was felt all over Britain. If you go and look at the Cenotaph itself, I remember the first time I saw it, I think it was from, I think it might have been from one of those open top bus tours when I was in my teens that maybe went down Whitehall and and the commentary, you know, through the earphone said, on the left is the Cenotaph, and I was struck by how small it seemed. I think when I had watched the ceremonies, the services of remembrance, I thought it was much larger. Maybe it's because the Queen's very, very small. <laughs> And when she steps forward to lay a wreath, she's dwarfed by the cenotaph. But I remember being struck by it, it being a relatively small object. It's also very simple. Maybe it was because he didn't have long to get the design done. He only had a couple of weeks, but Edwin Luchens came up with something incredibly stripped back. It is really little more than an outsize gravestone. It's a cenotaph, cenostaphos. That's Greek, I think. It means the empty tomb. It's in the form of a plinth upon which a coffin sits. A simple rendering of a coffin. But there's no words. Well, there's no religious phrasing on it. There's one phrase. It says, the glorious dead. There's a carved wreath at either end of the coffin. And that's it. That's it. That's, that's all there is in the way of twirls and, and swirls. But the subtleties of the design, the fine details that might well have been put there for Edwin Luchin's own reasons and his own satisfaction. But what appear to be the vertical sides going up, they're not parallel. And they would, in fact, converge at a point high above if you were to extend the lines of the verticals. And in fact, they would come together a thousand feet in the air. And the horizontal axis, the horizontal lines of the cenotaph, they're not straight either. They're actually 
little tiny arcs of a very, very large circle. And if that circle was actually to be drawn in its entirety, the other side of the circle would be a thousand feet under the ground. So the cenotaph is a central point which suggests a point a thousand feet in the sky and a point a thousand feet under the ground. And I came across long ago a wonderful essay or an article called The Secret of the Cenotaph and it was published in 1999 by an architect called Andrew Crompton. And within it, amongst other things, he suggested that perhaps Luchens was suggesting a sword of which the cenotaph is the hilt. So it's a, a sword either plunged into the heart of the nation or perhaps it's sheathed in the nation. And he wondered if it didn't suggest Excalibur, the hilt of Excalibur, King Arthur's legendary sword. And he wondered if Luchens was nodding towards the presence of Arthur's Excalibur in the cenotaph. And at the very least, I think it's an, an astonishing idea. And even before I read that piece, I had wondered myself when I looked at the, the subtle, simple shape of the cenotaph, if Edwin Luchens hadn't perhaps taken inspiration from a shape that seems to me to repeat in the British landscape. Sometimes it's a natural landform, other times it's there augmented by something that men and women have built. In 1901, long before he got to the design of the cenotaph, he was commissioned to restore Lindisfarne Castle on the island of Lindisfarne for its then owner, who was the publisher Edward Hudson. They knew each other, they were friends. And there were only ruins of a castle at that time. And so when you go to Lindisfarne now and you see the fairy tale castle and you're invited to think that it's ancient, but it's not. It's only been there for a century or so, but it does look the part. And I've often thought that, especially from a distance, the shape, the silhouette that Lindisfarne Castle creates, it's a bump in the landscape that the castle sits upon. And it suggests to me the same shape that Edwin Luchens then rendered for the cenotaph. But it's not just there. I seem to see it everywhere. Silbury Hill is supposed to have been inspired by Glastonbury Tor. Glastonbury Tor is a natural landform. It's strange though it looks with its tiered silhouette, but it's been suggested that so impressed were the Neolithic farmers of thousands of years ago by Glastonbury Tor that they created their own version of it in Silbury Hill. And Silbury Hill has the same shape. It's much eroded now, obviously, and has taken on a more rounded form. But in its original iteration, after its creation by the farmers, it would have had straighter sides. And I think it appears in the landscape as another vague suggestion of what we see in the cenotaph. And then Glastonbury Tor itself, natural, formed by glaciation or whatever, has on top of it a single tower that's all that's left of the Church of St Michael. It's a three-storey tower. But collectively, both the tor and the tower on top again suggests the form of Lindisfarne Castle and both together suggest the shape of the cenotaph in Whitehall. And I do wonder if there isn't the possibility that Luchens, amongst others, are inspired by that recurring shape. I mean, it's maybe just something from my imagination, but it's something I've thought for a long, long time. These places, these, these forms in the landscape, if they catch our attention, it's fair to imagine that they've always captured attention, that they captured the attention of the ancestor. And obviously we know that in Australia, the indigenous people, the first Australians, have described the song lines, which is a way that they were able to navigate through the trackless wastes of the outback and the rest of that extraordinary continent. They did it by singing songs that they learned in childhood and carried in memory for lifetimes that joined together like dots or stepping stones the various landforms that they would encounter one after the other. So lakes and rivers, mountains, valleys outcrops and whatever, if they sang the song lines as they moved through the landscape, 
It would tell them what to expect as they made their way from one place to another. And I've, I've long thought that the fact that we know about that in Australia is because a tiny fragment of connection to the elder world survives in Australia, courtesy of, of what remains of Aboriginal culture. But I think if people navigated in that way in Australia, it stands to reason that the ancestors all over the world did likewise. So that I've wondered if once upon a time there were song lines here in these British Isles as there were everywhere else. And that though we have forgotten them, there was a time before maps and the rest where people found their way through the landscape by singing the songs of the landscape. I think we are affected and pay attention to, to shapes and, and recurring shapes in the landscape more perhaps than we allow for. So these shapes were imprinted on our ancient ancestors' brains and have been passed down through the generations and we still have echoes of them today. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's something that I think is there subconsciously and that we acquire a sense of the landscape and, and in, in times when we depended upon the, the natural landscape more than we do now, I think it possibly inspired all sorts of creativity and, and maybe some fragment of that is there in the way Edwin Luchens reflected what he was aware of consciously or unconsciously in the landscape in the form of the cenotaph and it's not unreasonable to think that ancient memories survive and they survive in a form that so that we don't even necessarily know they're there we just carry them with us like inherited artifacts in Kerala in southern India there is just hanging on by its fingertips, the oldest continuously performed human ritual anywhere on planet Earth, the Kerala fire ritual. It seldom happens now, but there are still alive those who know what the Kerala fire ritual is and how to do it. It's a ritual based around building and setting fires and having fire consume various ritual structures over the course of a couple of days. And all the time it's going on, the Brahmin priests who officiate they chant long chants woven through with mantras. In the 1970s, Westerners started paying attention to the Kerala fire ritual and recorded it. They recorded the visual image of the performance and they also recorded the sound and went away and translated or decoded the various spoken words. And they got most of it done, but there were recurring phrases within these long, long chants that they just couldn't understand. And they went back to the priests and said, and let them listen to the, to the words and said, you, what, what are you saying here? And they said, well, we don't know. We just learn that. We learn it by rote in childhood. We learned it from our fathers. We teach our sons. And on and on it goes. These are just sounds that we learn by rote. So the, the Westerners went away and using... With the advent of, of computers, they were able to make comparisons, speeding the mantras up, slowing them down, and comparing them to other sounds in the natural world. And, and they found that the closest analogue was birdsong. Birds sing, you know, like if, if you have a robin in a tree outside your window, if you listen to it, the song is repetitive. It sings the same thing over and over again. And it, broadly speaking, certainly in the case of a robin, it, it's basically saying, this is my bush don't come anywhere near it or I'll kill you. But nonetheless, it's recurring patterns. So, to cut a long story short, it appears that fossilised, like shrimps in aspic, within the Kerala fire ritual, which is thousands upon thousands of years old, there may be the traces of the sounds that our species made before we had language. That if you go back far enough into the distant past, into the world of the ancestors, before we had language, before we had words, we communicated with other sounds like birdsong. So we communicated as the birds of the air, as the beasts of the forest. And the Kerala fire ritual is so old that it has preserved, like fossils, the sounds that our species made before we could talk. All of which, you know, I suppose it's funny to get to the Kerala fire ritual from the cenotaph in Whitehall, but... I started out by saying that people felt a profound need of places to go where they could mourn. And that's reaching deep into the human psyche. We're sophisticated 21st century creatures now, apparently, but the need is still there. Loss is profound. Grief is never ending. 
And sophisticated or not, it seems that many of us still need places to go in the landscape, places that we can connect to memories of those who are no longer with us. And that's something that ancestors were evidently doing for a very, very long time. And so the way in which the Cenotaph is a place where the nation goes to remember the dead of the First World War, that tradition, that noble tradition, something similar has meant something to our species for a very, very long time, which is just another part of why the Cenotaph in Whitehall means as much to me as it does. The simplicity of the cenotaph is part of its genius because you have to project onto it. Yes, you're right. You're, that's very good, actually. It is. It's like a screen. It's like a blank uh, billboard upon which the nation's imagination and the nation's grief can be projected. And without a doubt, there aren't many other memorials quite like it. So many of the war memorials, you know, they're either they're either soldiers or angels posed as though in action. Sometimes they're just standing to attention, heads bowed, in contemplative mood. But there's a lot more going on in them visually than there is in the cenotaph. The cenotaph it also makes me think sometimes about the monolith that appears in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001. That great block, that monolith that appears on the moon, it seems to have been just occurring and recurring throughout the universe since time immemorial. And there's something of Arthur C. Clarke's timeless monolith about the cenotaph. And yes, yes, you're right. The, the simplicity of it, simple or not, it says so very much, I think, because it invites us to come up with our own words, to take the place of, of the absent words. Once again, I come back to Julian Barnes' line from the novel Metroland, objects contain absent people. And if ever there were absent people, it's the millions that were harvested by the First World War. And if ever there was an object that seems to contain those absent people, it's the Cenotaph. Do you think it will always draw people to it? It, it seems to be the case. I remember when, oh, maybe 20 years ago now, as the last of the veterans of the First World War were dying of old age, those ancient men, you know, 100 years old and, and more, it was said and speculated that when the last of them was gone, we wouldn't bother with Armistice Day in quite the same way, that it would dwindle and fewer people would go. But in fact, quite the reverse has happened. And young people go young people who are many generations removed from anybody who fought and died in the First World War, they still seem to feel the need to go and remember on that day. I remember in 2015, the 100th anniversary of Gallipoli, which was Australia's great First World War disaster. So many people, including teenagers, wanted to go, physically to go to Gallipoli for the centenary on 2015. They had to do it by ballot. People applied for tickets and something like a tenth of the people who applied for tickets actually got tickets that enabled them to go. So even a hundred years after Gallipoli, so many Australians, including young Australians, wanted to go to the battlefield to remember that Australia had to put in place crowd control on a national scale just to try and control the numbers. So it seems as though we will, contrary to what were expectations a couple of decades ago, it seems that, as it rightly should, that the First World War will not be forgotten. Cradled in calloused hands, a graveyard beneath the sea, the Vikings found it a useful harbour. It was enlisted in the Napoleonic Wars by the British Admiralty. It was home to the Grand Fleet in the First World War. A bleak, wind-swept spot, with a lovely face but a broken heart. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, 
sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please do write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.